really with RDF, is that still all legal under RDFS? Is it like a subset of RDFS? So RDF is the uh, RDF is the, the way of expressing information. <coughs> RDFS is a way of describing the metadata about that information. So there's no um, oh. there's no restrictions on what you can say as such in RDFS. In fact, I'm not even sure that in um, that there are probably people who know RDFS better than I do even in this room. Uh, where uh, I don't know if there it's possible to, to come up with a consistency uh, exception. So, so is RDFS. it RDF is a way to make statements, and RDFS gives you a framework for the kind of statements you want to make about stuff? No, I don't know. So RDF gives you the ability to say things. RDFS gives you a way of uh, describing some of, a little bit of the semantics about what you're saying. Okay. It allows you to say things about the things you said. Yeah. Okay. So, um, let's see here. So one thing that uh, one very easy uh, piece of RDFS that uh, people are probably familiar with the idea of subclasses. So um, I'm going to make. So I'm going to start using Manchester syntax, which actually. There is, is, there is not quite the right uh, mapping between Mar Manchester syntax and RDFS uh, because Manchester syntax is really designed for OWL, but um, it's okay, we can fudge it. So if we have a class person and we want to say that all people are mortal, we do something like this. That's it. That's all it takes. That's that's, a, that's the Manchester syntax. You can, for uh, mortal or uh, person head is a subclass of mortal, and um, what and so we can do things like say um, we have an individual Socrates. And type as types person. We can infer from this that uh, they actually also have types mortal. Because of this. And actually, if we want to look at that in um, in uh, predicate logic, it would look something like this. So actually, let me show you what, uh, when we say something is subclass of, I'm going to give you the meaning of subclass of. So subclass of simply means C1, C2, and one x therefore c two x and there's, there's actually a little bit more about uh, subclass about uh, the transitivity of uh, subclass relationships uh, but that's uh, that actually doesn't impact uh, the actual uh, any x that you might have in instance information. So for those of you who are not familiar with this, all this is saying is that uh, subclass of, so if we have something where C1 is a subclass of C2, and there is an X is a class one, then X, then X is also a class two. Um, so if you want to, if you want to get uh, more formal about this, we could put uh, the uh, universal quantifiers in front of that for, so you, you would do this like this, which I'm not going to do for anything else. C1, C2, X. So for all C1, C2, and X, this is true. I'm not going to do that again, because it's, <laughs> it's implied in all of these things. 
In um, an RDFS, there's no way for uh, any sort of carnality or for, for some idea of notion of sum or there exists some that no. have this property. It's always all or nothing, right? In RDFS. Yeah. That's not until how you get to. Okay. Right. And that, that's only at the uh, <coughs> property restriction level. Yes, that's only right. That's right. Yeah. So um, we can do the same thing for properties, too, uh, which looks really similar. Uh, we can say, that, for instance, uh, so if you have a mother, you also have a parent who's that same person. So you would say that like this. You would say, So uh, this is uh, property subsumption. So this is actually where uh, Manchester isn't great for describing RDFS because RDFS doesn't have this idea of object properties versus data uh, properties. Uh, we, uh, I'm doing, so if Manchester syntax were to actually support RDFS, they would allow this, but they don't. So I'm just showing you the correct Manchester syntax because <laughs> I made it well. Object property has mother, is sub property of has parent. Um, so, one thing you can infer from this is again, not part of party of S, but has parent is also an object property. Uh, but the, uh, the thing is, you can say uh, Jim has mother, Patricia, my mom. Uh, you can infer from that that Jim has parent, Patricia. And so that's, it works exactly the same way as uh, class, except that um, we normally think of it as inheritance. It's not really inheritance. It's really about uh, adding additional information true about the sub-property, it's true about the parent property. So it's not quite the same. It doesn't, so when you think of uh, object-oriented object -oriented inherit, inheritance, you might think of it uh, as uh, assertions being pushed down the chain. Uh, uh, but this is actually about, um, since the assertions are actually about the individuals, they're being pushed up, they're basically being uh, pushed up the chain minor thing that sometimes trips people up. So classes have so classes have a, a notion of inheritance but properties. Right. Well that has to do with the, the fact that uh, a class um, so if you have uh, a class and that class has a superclass and that superclass is a superclass that first class is also a subclass of its super superclass. And so when you add things like uh, restrictions to that or those other things, that's where the inheritance comes in. It comes in at the class level. It doesn't come in at the individual level. And so that's, that's where uh, sometimes the confusion can lie. In, uh, but the thing is that it all tends to ground out to individuals when you actually talk about specific data. Um, okay, so domains and ranges. So um, a range is something like, um, so actually I'm just going to tack on here. So uh, I say, yeah. So uh, for this, you can say the domain of has mother is child, and the range is mother. 
kind of obvious. Um, but uh, what are domain and range? So this is so if uh, I go back to Jim. Uh, Jim has mother Patricia. I can also infer Jim a and actually a is a uh, a uh, in turtle at least uh, a, a shortcut for RDF type. So I'm going to be using that from now on. So no one get confused by that. Uh, Jim a uh, child, which in one sense I am, in the, I have the role of a child, my mother, even though I'm an adult. So there are two different ways, two different definitions for child. Cool thing about this is that you can actually distinguish those two synonyms that use the same term but ha are about different things, different classes. So this is the uh, relational child, not the uh, age child or intellectual age. Um, right, uh, then you'd also say Patricia, a mother. So these two things, actually, I should have. So I'm going to try and remember to use orange for the uh, uh, for the inferences. Uh, put a yellow dot next. What? Put a yeah. So these are both inferred from this and this, because we know that since we know the domain of has mother is child, we can then infer that Jim is the child. Since the range is mother, we can infer that Patricia is a mother. And that's actually really handy for a lot of stuff. Uh, it can be very tricky, though, because if you try to reuse those predicates outside of the intended class, you could end up with um, so for instance, uh, I believe uh, both name as the domain of uh, person, uh, or maybe agent. But I, if, I think it's agent and but if you range give a, of person. A teddy bear name, it doesn't mean it's an agent. So you have to be careful about what you yep. actually use these properties for. You have to check these domains and ranges to make sure that you're not overstepping the bounds of what was intended for that. Which story. predicate? Nose? Name. It's called both name? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's uh, both name has no domain nor range. Oh. oh, I don't know. I thought it had Perfect. a range person. Never mind. If it did, then that's a problem, but it doesn't. Both it gender is has a domain of agent. So you can't. So you can have a. a you can't a say male. your teddy bear is a male. Yeah. <laughs> so if you have male, I guess? If you're male, then you're running around doing things. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, right? I guess, sure. Okay. Um, okay. So that is that's that for RDF schema. Actually, Jim, I, perhaps more interesting. Both IMG, yeah, for image, has a domain of person. That's problematic. So Wait, don't what? hang IMG up. If it's not a person. <laughs> yeah. Why? You heard it here. That's an interesting one. I wonder why they did that. Because they're talking about. That's, they're that's, both. that's yeah. what they're. Yeah. Well, yeah, but they also have like depiction and other things as well. I don't. I would imagine depiction. Well, I guess not really. That's been used. IMG so is like a like sub property of depiction. Okay. Oh, okay. Which has no domain. <coughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I figured. Okay. I will yield to the chair. Thank you. <laughs> Fascinating discussion <laughs> that we can have later when we have a talk about both. Um, okay, so we're uh, actually we're on the owl now. Okay, and so OWL actually takes uh, into, uh, there's one issue with OWL that you hear come up, coming up a lot, and that is uh, uh, computability. Is a particular uh, ontology decidable or not? What, uh, you know, what logic is it in and so forth? Uh, so there's, uh, there's these two uh, major classes of OWL. I won't get into uh, the more specific uh, species, but there's all full, and the important difference is that there's also all DL. So, in, in case in case there's actually somebody watching and listening that doesn't know what all is, yeah, we'll get to that. All okay. stands for the web, 
ontology language. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> um, the best thing, so it's actually kind of interesting. So if you guys read Winnie the Pooh, um, Owl in Winnie the Pooh can't spell. So he asks Christopher Robin to make a sign for him. And uh, Christopher Robin makes him a sign, but it says lol. It doesn't say owl because Christopher <laughs> Robin can't spell either. Um, so I thought it was probably an interesting coincidence, but I thought it was great uh, because owl also uh, pretends to be very wise and so forth. Uh, of course, he's a toy, so it's no. Uh, <laughs> boy, there's lots of. Yeah, <laughs> There's a lot of similarities so the there. Other, the other reason, I think the other, I think the main reason is because they wanted something, uh, something where it's a language that's primarily about consistency, uh, to have just a little bit of inconsistency built into it. Uh, mm. um, and someone who was actually on the OWL committee <coughs> uh, can probably explain <laughs> better than I can at this point why it was called, why they did that. Uh, but OWL's a good name. Um, so, uh, so as I said, uh, owl full is basically everything that you can say in owl, regardless of its computability. And believe me, there is a lot of things you can say in owl full that is not computable. Uh, specifically, when you uh, when you treat um, at least in owl one, when you treat a uh, class as an individual. Uh, so if you make uh, individual-like assertions about a class, uh, then uh, you will, you'll just jump right into owl full and, and then it's not decidable anymore. Uh, there are tricks in owl two that I'll get to that get around that, but basically it's a, a, a strong barrier between the class <coughs> thing and the, uh, the individual thing. There are other things about uh, drawing distinctions between uh, data properties and object properties. So you can't have uh, a property that is both of those things, they're disjoint. Uh, there are other, uh, there are other uh, subtleties here and there, but those are the major issues that people run into a lot. And so, you know, there's a little bit of uh, computability and complexity in there, so. Isn't there another owl? Like a, a wimpy one? Is there There's owl light. You're not even going to talk about that because yeah, that's not interesting? Well, it is interesting, and it has to do more with uh, the efficiency of computation rather than whether or not you can compute it at all. Mm -hmm. So I'll, they say owl full, you'll never be able to uh, learn. You'll never finish. Owl DL, uh, it will finish in a finite time. The universe may end before then, <laughs> but it will finish someday. If given infinite time, it'll end before infinity, even if it's just before. Um, so the reason for this is uh, this goes back to, as I said, computability complexity. There's the full world of things that can be computed on a Turing machine, and that's uh, that is it. Uh, you know, that's, that's Turing complete. But then within there, there's the uh, the set of languages that is decidable, and those are um, uh, well, let's say decidable. There uh, is a set of things that you can say in OWL. This part is OWL full. Uh, and uh, there are, there's this other set of things you can say using a language called DL. And OWL doesn't support all of DL, which is why I drew it that way. Uh, but there is this group, this subset of decidable languages within DL called OWL DL. that is decidable. That means that, like I said, if you were to make an ontology and then make stuff about it, uh, and you uh, ran an inference engine over it, it would finish someday. It is not a complete, it is not everything that's decidable. 
that would be an amazing language if you could do that. But um, that's actually one of the things, you know, because girls are completeness there. One one of the things that is uh, undecidable is uh, enumerating all the things that are decidable. Um, so this is not. Uh, so we we have this smaller uh, group. <coughs> that it's more this circle's more like this for decidable things, and all the is a much smaller part of it. Um, that's why you can't just uh, compute every anything you can anything you want in all because it's only a subset of, of those sorts of things. So does DL stand for decidable language? Description language. Shit. <laughs> that would have been so <laughs> cool. Description <laughs> logic. Sorry, your description logic. logic. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Shouldn't have done that. Description logic, which is a subset of uh, predicate logic and a subset of and you know so forth and so on. There's lots of layers about what things can and can't be done in description logic. Um, and let's see if I forgot anything else. Um, right, and so uh, DL exists as a, as a subset because uh, uh, at this point people have pretty gotten very good at coming up with uh, rule engines and inference engines that can handle things in OWL DL. So it's a subset of OWL that is computable according to this uh, structure. And not just in theory, but in practice. Uh, so these inference engines have been built so that you can actually use, the, use these ontologies and know right off the bat that you can actually do something with it rather than just read it. So OWLful is great if you're expressing arbitrary knowledge. You don't plan to inference over it. You just want to express things. Uh, but you can't, um, uh, unless you had some, a purpose-built inference engine for that ontology, uh, you don't know if it's going to ever finish inferencing. Um, okay, so so all DL was defined by teams of people doing mathematical proofs. Yes. So DL is defined by that. All yeah. DL is defined as uh, by uh, mapping specific course sub languages of OWL into uh, DL. Into DL, okay. and basically proving that. So OWL was designed from DL in one sense, uh, and it was so a lot of the things that you see in DL you see as constructs in OWL. Not all the constructs are there, but that's, yeah, you gotta finish sometime. Okay, so, uh, so all property characteristics. So I mentioned before object properties, there are object properties and data type properties. Uh, object property is a relationship between uh, two instances of classes, so uh, between two resources that are individuals. Um, a data type property is a relationship between an instance of a class and an RDF literal uh, or other uh, XML schema data types. Um, and as I said before, in OWL DL, uh, yeah, in OWL DL, uh, they're disjoint, so you can't have. So that's actually one reason why things like both. Uh, and other <coughs> RDFS uh, schemas are hard to work with in uh, OWLs because they don't have that distinction between data type properties and object properties. So use of those of those properties may be um, may actually be uh, one or the other by convention, but there's nothing explicitly saying that there's that distinction there. It would be nice to add that actually to RFS. I think it's a handy dividing line. It would make little, it would make uh, working with the two a little bit easier. But I'm not on either committee. <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, so there's a bunch of these uh, property characteristics. So inverse of is probably one of the handier ones. And so we can say something like um, object property, sorry, um, I do top has parent. So 
we have an object property has parent, and we can say that there's a, an inverse of has child. I hope that's pretty clear for everyone. Uh, so if you, so I have someone as a parent, they have me as a child. And so you would say, um, kind of in general, if you say X, P, 1, Y, then you would also then say uh, Y, P, 2 of X, if these are, if these are inverse properties. So it's, it's very straightforward. Um, hope. Uh, but the idea is that it's th this, it flips things around for you. Um, so another, there's another one that is a uh, transitive. So, um, so staying on the genealogical theme as ancestor. is in principle a you say it's transitive um, if uh, basically what that means is that um, well if you know, if I have an ancestor and they have an ancestor, I have that, that other ancestor as well. So this usually looks like um, you know, let's say P we'll say going back to P1, I'm going back to predicate logic, uh, X, Y, and P1, Y, Z we get uh, P1 X Z and the cool thing is that it actually this rule by itself well along with saying that it's transitive so if you want to say transitive The, trans the closure of this transitivity is built into this rule because it'll just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And so you don't get, um, you don't have to do any more than this. Uh, sometimes you might want to cache that and, and memorize the values for it, but it's actually, uh, and depending on which way you discover it, it could be pretty efficient. But I won't go into that because uh, uh, we have a in, we have a reasoning talk coming up next. Not today, though. Um, so, uh, other uh, other things that are um, other characteristics that you can have uh, uh, symmetry. So you can have and so something like related to. So if I'm related to my brother, my brother's related to me. And so I only have to assert one side of it, the other side will be inferred. So, you know, Jim related, related to Jay, you can infer that Jay related to Jim if it's a symmetric property. Um, so the, uh, another uh, characteristic is uh, functional. Uh, functional mean so uh, one example of a functional property is birth mother there's only one person who gave birth to each of us and so if we if we say um, uh, say X has birth birth mother y and then we also say x has birth mother 
z, what do we do with that? y and z have to be the same then? Yes, exactly. So we, what we infer is y same as z. So it, uh, this is what is called, the, I mean, this is part of the open world assumption, but it's the uh, non-unique naming assumption. Just because you, so you can have two names in the semantic web that refer to the same entity, but, or denote the same entity, I should say. Um, we don't know whether or not they're the same entity or not until we make this assertion. We know if we have the same name, if we say Y, whenever we talk about Y, we're always talking about the same thing, but sometimes we can be talking about something else and still be talking about the same thing. The same as assertion is uh, perfectly viable between any two entities unless uh, the, it's reversed uh, that they're different from each other has been asserted. So anything can be the same as anything else in the semantic web without, uh, you know, unless it's been stated otherwise. Um, so how do you set up a, so I can have X his birth mother Z, mm -hmm. Y his birth mother Z. Um, X and Y could be, they could be the same. They could be. Or they could be different. There's nothing in so this that says that. Right. So what you want, actually, is... So there's nothing to be concluded from that. Right. What you're t thinking of is inverse functional. And I have an example here. Uh, oh, wait, no, sorry. Has Earth. Sorry. Okay, yeah. Is, is birth child? <laughs> it's child. It's uh, birth mother of. Ah. It's, it's child. I wrote it backwards in my notes. I wanted to make sure I actually got it right in my head at least. Um, so birth mother of does the reverse of this. So if I say, you know, X, that's definitely not true. Um, Y, Z. So we can do this for the inverse functional. This is actually this can be very a very tricky uh, thing to do. Um, in fact, it's not allowed on. Uh, it's only allowed for object properties. It's only allowed for object properties. It's not allowed for data type properties at all. But you can't. Why is that? That's that 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 shouldn't be true. What do you mean that shouldn't? No, this yeah. Sorry. Do birth mother of. Oh, okay, right, right, right. Sorry. Trying to read yeah. stuff. <laughs> so yeah, so this is now correct. So you can infer that these two are the same because they. Uh, they both are the been stated to be the birth mother of X. The fact that something is inverse functional stated that this can only be there's only one thing for X that can be that thing. So therefore, we infer that the same thing. I have a question that I don't know if I can say it clearly enough for it to be a useful question, but I can see how for most of these having them at your disposal allows you to do more reasoning and come up with more conclusions than you would have been able to do without them, mm -hmm. except for inverse of? Is that just for the convenience of humans? Like it's nice to be able to say has child and it's nice to be able to say has mother depending on what you know about, Yeah. depending on your perspective, but do you actually get any additional value out of that other than being able to link up these two? Well, sometimes uh, the semantics of one side versus the other uh, may be different, so you can actually uh, put um, put property restrictions on one side of it that uh, where it makes more sense to, uh, where it's easier to express. Mm -hmm. or but only easier for humans, right? Well, 
sometimes it's only possible to express it on that side, hmm. but you want to be able to say the reverse of it as well because that's actually how the data is naturally modeled. Um, See, so the other thing, this is, uh, and uh, speaking of uh, usefulness, uh, there's another characteristic, and that's uh, reflexivity. Um, I can actually put an example from my video. I think it's just reflexive. Uh, this is one where I didn't write it down here, so I may not have the syntax correct. So uh, check it out for yourself. So um, so knows is a reflexive property. You know yourself, hopefully. Um, and all this means is that for everything, if I make a thing, so thing, so x is now, now exists. Because of this, and for no other reason than it exists, we can say x knows x. That's all it takes. And that's how reflexivity works, is that it automatically, so I mean, you might have things that you know, or uh, people that you know that aren't you, but uh, no matter what, you always are at least gonna know yourself. Sometimes it's useful. Okay. What is another example other than know that, that uses that? Um, so, uh, um, various types of identity uh, can be done using reflexivity. So, um, uh, it's actually in um, in SCOS when you have a. So, actually, if you want to be able to refer to something at, to a given thing and all of its, say you have a uh, transitive property and to that property extends out a bunch of other stuff. So you want to know a thing, it's, you want to have a reference to the thing itself and all the stuff that it's got, that it uh, has as a transitive, transitive relation, mm -hmm. then you would use uh, reflexive. So you make it reflexive and transitive and then you can say you can basically add the thing to the group itself. So that's one case where nose is important. Um, uh, this can be used in things like SCOS where you want to have a you know, recurrent concept and any anything uh, broader, or everything that is, uh, has this broader relation, or everything that has this narrower relation, you want to include it in the group. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so Next, we're on to into dangerous waters. Uh, owl identity. And if I could spell it, I'd be much better off. Um, these are things like uh, same as, and then same as has a few um, uh, cousins called uh, equivalent class and equivalent property. Uh, they did this to keep. DL possible, so uh, you're not using the same predicate for a class that you'd use for an individual or a uh, property. Um, so that keeps the partition between the, the three worlds. Um, what are the three worlds? So classes, properties, and individuals. Oh, okay. And properties are subdivided into data properties and object properties. Um, so we might say uh, a moon, and then we could say that same as AL, which is the symbol for the moon. So you might have a you are a, a, a resource that refers to it as 
you know, in, in some other system, you want to link them together. That same as allows you to do that. Um, similarly, um, with uh, actually with classes, on the other hand, uh, this lets you do some interesting things. And the specifics of what I'm going to do, I'll uh, talk about later. But so you can say class parent equivalent to uh, mother mother or father and um, for those of you who know this stuff already what I did there. Um, I basically said that the, um, everything that's a parent is a mother or father. Now you're thinking, well, you could just make mother and father some class as a parent. Sure, except that um, that that's only in one direction. So this this is actually a good opportunity to talk about uh, necessary and sufficient conditions when it comes to. Uh, identity in classes, subclasses, and superclasses. So, um, some of you, uh, so, so necessary. So, these are the things that must be true about a particular, about anything that belongs to a class. So, for instance, like I said before, uh, first, uh, people are mortal. So, uh, if I say a uh, person, subclass of mortal, well, what I'm saying is that being a mortal is a necessary condition of being a person. You cannot be a person without being mortal, at least today. Maybe 50 years, who knows. Right now, that's, that's, what, that's how it works. So, sufficient is the inverse of that. So it, all the stuff that if you are it, that's the, that is sufficient for you to belong to that class. So being a person is sufficient to being a mortal, which basically means if you are a person, it's the reverse. So if you are a person, then you are a mortal. Conversely, you know, being, so being a mortal is, is necessary to being a person, but then uh, um, being a person is sufficient to being a mortal. So the two sides of the same. Other things are mortal, is what you mean. Exactly. It's not, there are other, yes, there are other things that are mortal that are not people, but it is good enough to be a person to be mortal. So equivalent to is both. These are necessary and sufficient conditions. So if anyone has taken philosophy class, this sounds very familiar. Uh, but it is the stuff that is, is true, is sufficient to be true, and is necessary to be true. The stuff that, you know, basically, if you are a parent, you are either a mother or a father. There's no getting around that. That's going to happen. And if you're a mother, you're a parent. If you're a father, you're a parent, and, um, and vice versa. So it goes both ways. The reason why you would do something like this is you, uh, this allows you to close parenthood over the sets mother and father. So the union of mother and father is equivalent to the class parent, is what this is saying. So, so that's saying you can't have any other subclasses of parent. No, that's not what it's saying. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> saying that anything belong that belongs to a subclass of parent is either a mother or father. Okay. That open world assumption again. Because if you, you know, it's also multiple inheritance, you can belong to more than one class. 
And so by belonging to the class of parent, we can have whatever you want as a class as a parent. But, and, you know, like band parent? Yeah, band parent, <laughs> parent, which is orthogonal to being a mother or father. Um, and so you can say, well, you can do the same thing with this. You can also say it's equivalent to being a good parent or a bad parent, which is not quite true because you can be a middling parent or anything else. Um, so um, some, some politicians rhetoric lends itself well to <laughs> these sorts of sets, but I won't get into that. Um, Oh, actually, speaking of uh, closure, this is a really stupid joke, but I want to get it in there. Um, <laughs> Yay, that's commitment. <laughs> yes, it is. Really stupid. So, uh, three logicians walk into a bar, and the waitress says to them, so, do you all want some beer? The first one says, I don't know. The second one says, I don't know. The third one says, yes. And, yeah. Okay. So, what happens is... <laughs> What happens is you go look up the joke and not make me explain it. <laughs> Hopefully the fact that I put that joke in, that stupid joke in there is humor enough. Um, anyway. I'm going to have to Google this. <laughs> <laughs> now no one's going to be paying attention to no. my identity talk. Okay, so this is important. So... So now that you're not paying attention looking at my joke, <laughs> this is really important. Same as is mathematical identity. It is necessary and sufficient conditions. So everything that's true about one thing, if you say it's the same as something else, that other thing, it's also true about that other thing. Everything you say, everything. And so you have to be really careful with that. This Wait. is why same as starts fights. Yes, exactly. This is why same as is a very controversial thing to use. Uh, in a loose way. How is same as different than equivalent to? Same as is about individuals. Equivalent to is about classes. Oh, uh, okay. So uh, <coughs> same as is kind of the, so uh, equivalent to is a set theoretic thing, necessary and sufficient conditions. Same as is what's called uh, Leibnizian identity. So uh, it's the indiscernibility of identicals and the uh, identity of indiscernibles. So two things, if you can't tell two things apart, they're the same thing in one part of the identity. Asserting same as is saying, these are the same things, therefore they're indiscernible. And they're indiscernible because everything that's true about one thing is true about the other thing and vice versa. So be careful, that's what I'm saying. Mean it, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, really mean it because it, it can cause a lot of trouble if you get it wrong. I've been actually, especially equivalent to, if you're trying to, if you're using equivalent to to map between two ontologies, uh, you have to be really careful about that because there's, there might be stuff in there that you didn't mean. You have to really check everything because you can end up with uh, with you know, with reasoning errors because of that. Just very very careful. Um, the inverse of that is uh, different from, which are for individuals. Uh, disjoint class, which is uh, that there's no way that something belongs to one class can belong to another class. So this, the two sets of that represent those classes are disjoint from each other. There are no overlaps. There are no individuals that belong to both sets. What are the two terms again? Different from and? Disjoint class. Disjoint class. There's also disjoint property, which says the same thing. So if you have uh, any, if there's any statements about uh, two, yeah, any state, no, it's just that, uh, so what would you say, <coughs> property, disjoint property, another property, yeah, and then you must never have, I don't know, how would, how would you apply that? Actually, I'm not sure exactly what the, what, uh, di how disjoint property works. Uh, Is that is that just a way to tell other people that are maybe doing other ontology mappings to say, hey, look out, this is different than this other thing that it kind of sounds the same as? No, I think it's, it, might, it might be a little bit stronger than that, but I'm not sure. If, if I were to guess, I'm not going to. it even if it's stronger, even if it's well-defined, is it useful for anything, for any reasoning stuff? 
I, it's very rare. I haven't seen it in practice that much, which doesn't mean it doesn't happen. So th that actually kind of leads to, to, to what extent are some of these useful for um, testing as opposed to That's usually different. what disjointness is used for. It's yeah. for testing ontologies to make sure they're consistent. Yeah. Uh, very rarely do you see disjointness. Well, I don't like to put disjointness in my, uh, in my ontologies uh, because it is um, it's a way of triggering um, consistency exceptions. And I found personally that it's a lot easier to come up with a counterexample to a disjointness uh, assertion than it is to actually come up with a valid disjointness assertion. Um, just, you know, you, you're, you know, you have to really think about everything in the universe about these two sets. Will they never, ever, 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 under any circumstances that you'll ever encounter be the same thing? And even then, you probably should hold off and just maybe you don't need it. Especially if it doesn't help you do any reasoning. Stuff, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. But so that's probably less difficult with properties than it is with classes. You know, the classes I can see, but with properties, you know, you can have rules that specifically, you can't have them both asserted. I could, I, I could Right, so actually, yeah, so if you say, um, so you can make things like love and hate be disjoint, so, which is not true. Again, there's kind oh, of plenty of examples for that one. Uh, but. That's the uh, that's the idea is that if you think that yeah if uh, you know something can't something loves something can't hate it uh, you can't uh, so being a parent of someone means you can't be a child of them that would uh, be useful. unless we had time travel but, yeah there exactly time travel like is always said, messing up now like I said there's always kind of examples <laughs> always kind of examples. <laughs> I mean, especially if you, if you decide to use it to discuss fictional characters, then, yes. uh, <laughs> yes. then uh, you know, things get all sorts of crazy. Uh, there are predicates, or there are uh, ways of expressing mutual sameness, um, like same individuals, equivalent classes, equivalent properties. I'm not going to go into that that much, though. Um, there's also the ability to describe uh, a class is a disjoint union, so mother or father, so you can uh, make person be a disjoint union, so this mother or father thing, except that it's actually, uh, say, child and adult. You can't be a child and an adult, but those are the two broad, closed categories of person. But you just said you were. That's a different kind of, kind of child. So. <laughs> So um, the next thing is uh, uh, so since we're talking, we've talked about or already. There's uh, set operators. So as I mentioned before, owl classes and and so forth are based on set theory. So um, you have things like uh, so intersection. Uh, The intersection of two classes are things like um, you can further define mother as being equivalent to female and as child. Um, person, and I'll explain what that, what exactly that means in a bit. But this is an intersection between those two classes. So uh, everything that's in, uh, so mother is defined as the set of females who have children, who have child, uh, children, or at least one child. Um, union. We, actually, we did we did union already, but I'll show it again just to be complete. Union looks like uh, person equivalent to um, male or female. So 
that's that's a union. Uh, this ability to have uh, basically two things together. Um, complement is uh, is negation essentially. So uh, you'll note that I'm talking about and and or. In this case, not. So. Um, so it, it, we would define unmarried person as being equivalent to a person and and not as spouse some person. So you can actually do this by saying that you have a spouse and a single person. So unmarried person is disjoint from from uh, spouse uh, and have this be the definition of spouse. Uh, but if you don't, if you want to, this is another way of defining it. Sometimes it's useful to directly talk about that rather than setting up a, a class to have disjointness against it. Um, enumeration is things like. Um, so if you want to set a list of permissible values, so what? I, well, sorry, before I move on to that, I just what was that? What was that defining again? Uh, unmarried person. Oh, okay. okay. So you'll note that I'm kind of out, I'm kind of cutting back on the right. What does it? What what we're showing here? Uh, you know, you have class colon here, mm -hmm. and then right, right. here. Um, the thing is, actually, once you once you learn this stuff, especially the stuff that I'm putting in here like this, that's uh, when you're using protege um, and you're using the class expression editor. It's all this stuff. So you're actually using Manchester syntax when you're doing that. So it's, uh, some of this should seem familiar. As soon as you start using protege, this will be very familiar uh, when you start doing that stuff. Um, enumeration. So if you have a, so let's say you have a, has employment status. Uh, and again, I'm abbreviating things for brevity's sake. Do things like range is this enumerated class, which is curly braces, full time. And these aren't classes, these are individuals, by the way. So that's the idea here is that you actually have individuals that are allowed, in this case, are allowed in the range. So if you're given something that isn't in this set, it is an, uh, one of these things, we just don't know what it is yet. Um, so full time, part time. <coughs> So you can do things like specify exactly the values that you want in this, in this case, that you want as uh, the, the, in this class. So what are the individuals that are allowed to be in this class? And that, that would be this, this enumeration. You can also uh, explicitly enumerate just a regular class as well and say these are all the things that can be part of it. So if you have, um, yeah, so if you have various descriptors or qualities that you want to talk about, you can do that. How does that not break the open world assumption that you say these are the only subclasses that can be in this class? Well, these aren't classes. These are individuals. But didn't you just say you can do it with classes, too? Well, you can set it. You can set the, a class as being equivalent to this. But only at the individual level. You can't say this class can only have these subclasses. Well, no, you do that with, uh, with union. So when you say, so a person, so a parent could be a mother or father, 
Right. Mm -hmm. A person can be a child or adult, mm -hmm. uh, and only those things. Mm -hmm. But when you say person is equivalent to child or adult, you're closing the person class mm -hmm. to everything that's in those two, that is either a child or adult. You're saying that everything that is a person is one of these two things. Mm -hmm. The reason why that works in the open world assumption is because you're not saying you're not saying that something that come, that has a has a class that's subclass of person. So um, man can be subclass of person. Mm -hmm. uh, all you know is they're one of those things. You don't know which one, mm -hmm. but you're adding that to it. You're not you're not. Uh, discovering an inconsistency. Mm -hmm. You're just discovering, you're creating known unknowns. Okay, Donald. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes I wonder if you study this stuff. So um, I wanted to do a, a, just a time check here. Okay. Um, you're about an hour, and uh, almost an hour and a half in. Okay. okay. And, um, and you, know, you can continue on. You could make sure. You, uh, one of the right. things I wanted to ask you to um, talk about at some point, if you could, is, is some of the practical aspects of this. Okay. Okay. You know, you, you mentioned using Protege, um, right. but you know, in, from a from sort of a system perspective, you've got right. data, you've got ontology, you've got somewhere there's a, a triple store and inference engine. Yeah. How do these things interact? But you know, answer that at some point. But okay. Yeah. So I mean, actually, um, yeah, I still have a bit left on uh, cardinality, literal values, existential, universal restriction. And actually, I have this here. So I may as well talk about this. So this is what's called an existential uh, restriction. Uh, basically, saying that there is. So if you if you're in this class. Then you have a spouse. That spouse is a person. That's all that means. There's something out there that is a spouse. Doesn't matter. If you don't know what it is, then you uh, you just know that there's this thing out there that it's an, again a known unknown. Um, if you have um, if you have a spouse and you know that that is closed, that you can have only one spouse. Uh, that well, so that's what's called max cardinality. You can also say something like has spouse max one person. Uh, so that makes it so that any if you if you're listed as so if you have statements where you know x and y uh, both spouses. Then be, if, if this has been asserted, then you would also get that um, those are the same person. Similarly, if you have, uh, if you actually open that up, uh, as spouse max one, then uh, you know that anything that's been declared to be someone's spouse is a person because there's only, you know, you've identified that one thing, that existential. Um, min one is also available, and that uh, talks that basically guarantees that there's a value. If there isn't, then it assumes that there's a value that's unknown. Um, um, ex you can have exactly one, which does min and max. It's a little bit easier to describe. Uh, you can set explicit values, so you can say um, a particular. Uh, so, woman, if you have a, pr a property, has sex uh, or has gender. As gender, um, you can and you wanted to define the class woman as the. Uh, you can say that uh, they uh, they're a person and they have sex value female. So that's basically turning a uh, you know property that describes something and uh, inferring a class from it, and vice versa. If you have woman, you can know that you will infer that uh, anything that does that also is, has sex female. Um, and actually, that is uh, that sort of thing is where the stuff ends up being useful because uh, different ontologies will have different styles of expressing their data. And so, if you have uh, one ontology where 
uh, they're using uh, uh, Hazo relations, uh, then, and you wanted to map it to something that uses Isa relations, you would use stuff like that. So you would identify these values and say, well, if you see this in this field, in this uh, property, then they belong to this class, and vice versa. If they belong to this class, they're going to have this value in this field. So that allows you to map between two uh, multiple data systems. Uh, in fact, I did that with uh, recently with um, uh, some CI ontologies, where they had these uh, codes. It's like a, um, it's called an egg code. And it's basically, you know, there's uh, one, one, three, one, two, three, nine. So th there's these codes, and they encode certain knowledge about the ice. So there's things like uh, the ice the ice concentration and the uh, the ice formation, like uh, what stage of the ice that, that, that it's in, uh, what is the shape of the ice, like how big are the flows, and so forth. And all of this stuff tells you a lot about what the conditions are out on out on the sea. And so what we did was we, uh, we encoded how, uh, how that's these values and assigned them to pieces of information in the ontology. So we knew that if we saw three, let's say, uh, let's say this is the concentration row. If we saw three in the concentration row, then we know that the ice concentration is three tenths. Uh, so you know, three tenths of the water out there is covered by whatever kind of ice this column represents. And uh, so when you do that, you can actually map back and forth between these data objects and the knowledge that those objects represent. And I got to actually write a converter for, uh, for these codes to, uh, to create RDF from them. And you actually go and take that RDF and put it into a reasoner with the ontology, it will it will fill it out. Basically, it'll, it'll finish out all the knowledge that you have. What are those codes called? It's called egg codes. Egg. egg yeah, codes. informally they're called egg codes because they're ovals. Oh, okay. Hmm. Um, they're not so. The people who are in charge of that uh, don't officially call them egg codes. But um, that's Googleable, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Okay. Well, it's like egg codes, ice. Yeah. Something like yeah. Um, RDF. <laughs> well, McCusker. <my> <laughs> <laughs> Just made it up now. <laughs> um, okay. So, I'm just doing these talks. I feel like, and now is a Google opportunity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> For those in the audience. <laughs> okay. So um, there are a couple of really neat all two features that I want to talk about. Uh, Punning is probably less relevant for you guys, but I find it really neat because it lets you uh, talk about the, um, uh, use the same URI for a class and an individual, and talk about them at the same time without getting What's that called? Punting. Punning. 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 Yeah. Okay. So you're using the same word twice in different meanings. I know. Okay. Um, and so you can have the class eagle, which is this, the set of entities that are eagles. But then you also have the individual eagle that corresponds to, say, a concept or a species, which can be a concept. Uh, and you can talk about things about that, you know, like certain, uh, you might have things that aren't easily represented using these restrictions, but you still want to describe them as characteristics. Uh, or you might want to provide the, uh, uh, you know, provide uh, the idea of it as the species, the entry as a species, and so forth. Uh, that's called metamodeling. And so it's usually the idea that you have this some information that doesn't work directly in the, a conventional meta model like OWL. And so you want to expand what you can say about your classes beyond the, what's available in the, meta, in the regular meta model. So you're basically making a new one that sits alongside OWL or some of these other meta models to say more than you would normally be able to. Um, 
So you can use annotation properties on any property now, not just uh, RDFS label and so forth, although those are highly recommended. You can make up uh, annotation properties as you go. So annotation properties are things where uh, you can say something, but nothing will be inferred about it. So if you, uh, so you can't set ranges or domains on, it, on annotation properties or use them in restrictions or anything like that. Or if you do, it'll just be ignored depending on the reason or anything. Um, XSD facets are kind of cool. This is a, this is um, something like, uh, you, if you want to define adult. So, you said yeah. the annotation properties thing, is that is just a way to decorate the? Yeah. Just human readable assertions about uh, but are they all, but they're also but it's it, it's presumably also done in RDF so it's queryable and stuff. So oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's just not your. So it's, it's, it's the important thing is that you can't infer things about it. It's not a new. Uh, it's not new to the RDF. It's new to OWL. Uh, so if you wanted to find adult, you can say that um, uh, age. Uh, so equivalent to I mean, this uh, Manchester syntax, equivalent to age only, which is the universal property. So uh, age only has things that belong to the class. Class is XSD decimal. Uh, that is greater than 18. And it will automatically, if you have an age that's greater than 18, you will be, uh, you'll be inferred to be an adult. So, no, just again, this is L2? Yeah. Okay, you might want to mark L2. Oh. Yeah. L2. When did the L2 start? Uh, it was, it, well, it started pretty much right after L1. Yeah, I know, but in, in this talk. Like. Oh, uh, punning. Okay. Uh. So punning, annotation properties, XSD facets, these are, the, these are the things I've talked about so far. Um, this goes both This goes both ways. Uh, you can say that um, because I'm saying only an equivalent, uh, any, anything that has an age greater than 18 is an adult, which is not quite true because you might have tortoises that are greater than 18, but that doesn't mean they're adults. Um, property chains are the last thing on the list, and then actually we can open it up to the discussion about operations and so forth, because um, I think that that is important, and then we can just kind of have general questions. Um, so if you wanted to find an uncle in terms of brothers and parents, uh, you would say, as parent, that's the chain, it's a link in the chain, as um, brother. So. So that's what, like, in, like a circle. Yeah, that's okay. just O. The letter O. Okay. So has uncle. This actually is expanded to oh, do that. Um, sub property chain, which is still not readable. Sorry. <laughs> That's what you get when you write on the board. Um, so uh, basically, this is defining, saying that. Um, you have a parent, that parent has a brother, that brother is your uncle. And, uh, it's actually very straightforward to do, and you can do a lot of interesting things with it. Um, and uh, basically, do uh, you can do conditional, uh, you can pull over properties from uh, across uh, custom identities. So if you don't want to use same as, 
you can actually say, for instance, that a, um, you know, I've got this kind of sort of like this other thing, and then define which properties are actually the same between the two things uh, when you have that relation. And so that uh, property chains let you do that on a case by case basis without doing, pulling it all over. Um, and that is everything that I plan to talk about. Can those be chained together? So could you conceivably have another property in that chain? Oh yeah, you can keep going forever. Well, we run into disk space. Can you only do one at each step? Like, this would be a stupid way to do it, but you, could you do has parent, Cheerio, has brother or has sister? No. And then has what child for like a cousin, even though you would want to do has sister? No, someone. what you do is you add another one. You would say has, well, I mean, so, so this is uncle, obviously. What if you want to do cousin through your parents, brother, or sister? Okay, so you would do, you would make another property. as cousin. And so um, if you had, so you would have uh, uh, has uncle, has child, and then you make another property chain, has aunt, aunt has so you can do you can have more than one property chain on a given um, on a given property sub property chain okay yeah. when you use it in protege it's just you click on the button where it says property chain and you enter this stuff so it's very it's very straightforward once you know the syntax So usually what I do when I'm writing ontologies is I put them, I, I compose them in protege if I'm doing it on my own. If I'm doing it with a domain expert, I usually start off in CMAP. As soon as I do anything beyond domains and ranges, I switch over to protege. Um, I try to, so in my most recent um, attempts at writing ontologies, what I've done is I've actually uh, uh, written out, I've had Protege save the, the file as uh, in this Manchester syntax because it is very much like computer code, which means that source control systems can manage it much better than XML or Turtle or any of the mm. other ones. And so when I do that, it, um, you know, but when I actually publish the ontology, I save it out as I'll, uh, RDF XML and refer to that when I actually set up the URI. Um, and very often uh, when I set up a URI, I use uh, Perl.org. That's Perl.org. And I've got a namespace there actually for Tetherless World. And actually, I highly recommend that if you publish an ontology, you use a Perl for it. We, ha we own Perl slash TWC. And if you get yourself an account, those of you in Tetris anyway, uh, for the world, uh, if you uh, want to publish an ontology in, uh, in here, I can add you as a maintainer so you can start adding ontologies. Uh, we have a sub, something under there that's this ontology. And then, you know, whatever the actual ontology name is, this will redirect to where you configure it to redirect to, which I usually put into a source control system. And when, uh, and so we can just keep updating the latest version. This will keep redirecting it. You have a nice short URI for your ontology, and it's not tied specifically to any one source control system. So if you migrate it from one system to another, you'll keep the same URI for it, and it will continue to dereference it, but it will just point to a new place once you reconfigure it. Um, and so that's that's makes it that makes your ontology link data, and it's just good practice in general. Um, a lot of triple stores now will 
uh, kind of uh, as part of their configuration do some level of inferencing or another, uh, or even virtu uh, so virtuoso will do RDFS, and I believe it has some uh, configurations for limited OWL reasoning. Um, Jenna will do reasoning over any old model that you give it, um, uh, even if it's uh, even if it's not terribly efficient. Um, uh, uh, Clark and Parsia has a new uh, triple score uh, they call uh, Stardog, it's in beta, and they, uh, they focus on putting reasoning very close to the iron, very close to the data, so that it's, uh, I've, I've heard there's very good benchmarks from it now, uh, they do full, full LDL reasoning, it's bigger where you can turn things on and off. So you say a lot of triple stores will do some inference as part of their configuration. Like, so what if you want to do more inference? How do you hook up like this reasoning engine or whatever you call it to it? Yeah, that, that's yeah. actually what I wanted to get to earlier. I wanted mm. to sort of, okay. <laughs> how do you work with this? Yeah, 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 how do you do things for real? Usually, okay. Yeah, that's, so usually what I do is I have, um, so uh, if the triple store that I'm working with doesn't do inferencing, in some, in, inside of it. What I'll do if I really need inferencing is I'll put, I'll uh, use Jenna on top of it and, and use uh, one of Jenna's uh, inferencing engines. So Pellet actually is compatible with Jenna and the incremental Pellet uh, probably is your, one of your best bets for efficiency. Um, I also use general rules a lot because general rules let you write custom rules in a very flexible language. It actually lets you extend OWL at the, uh, the second order logic. So when I was putting in variables for classes and properties, uh, in when I was writing out the rules for things like subclass of, and I was saying this, you know, this class is a variable, this class is a variable, this property is a variable, that's second order logic. Mm -hmm. Second order predicate logic. First order predicate logic is where you always have the um, where you have the classes and properties are always explicitly defined. You can't have variables in those positions. Uh, second order predicate logic is what you write the rules that implement first order predicate logic in. So you okay, what's what's defined in first order predicate logic? So that can't be variables. So classes and properties. Okay. But the predicates in that's right. that are in predicate logic. Uh, Jenna, let's, uh, Jenna supports, although it's a very big loaded gun pointed at your foot, it <laughs> supports doing second order predicate logic just because the way their rule engine works. It's a basic graph pattern match system where it will just keep matching patterns until it doesn't find anything new. Uh, like I said, it's a very big gun. Uh, so uh, you have to be careful with it. Looks like, uh, so uh, I need real, a lot of flexibility. I usually go with that. I just want to do basic DL stuff. I want to do it fast. I often do it with pellet, try and integrate that in, or just the conventional rules. If I want it really, really fast, I try to make sure that the rule engine is built into the triple store. So the tri memory. what triple stores does the tetherless world keep their junk in? Junk. Stuff. <laughs> Junk. Valued stuff. Um, virtuoso. That, yeah, so Virtuoso is a big one. Uh, I guess, actually, John is actually well, the data go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, so a, a lot of our big stuff is in Virtuoso. Um, and th that's primarily due to scale. Um, and, and I know in the, the case of the Linking open government data work, the log D stuff, they're not really using um, that capability. You know, it's primarily um, there because it, it's a large capacity triple store with good, um, you know, with good endpoints, mm -hmm. you know, so we can get efficient searching and that sort of thing. So, so we're going for that side of it. So it's a, it's a lower level stuff. You know, there's there's a, a certain amount of um, RDFS type stuff that's going on, but we're not using. Right. Um, although you know, in the conversion part, um, so there's there's some inferencing that's going on as part of our conversion automation. Okay, so it's for the front end. So it's it's almost like 
think, you could think of it as inferencing done ahead of time, pre-cooking the inferencing. Yeah. So that when is it, that like the data enrichment be, step? Yeah, that's exactly it. So, okay. so it's sort of, you know, you you got a choice. You, you can either put raw data in with a with a ton of rules and do the inferencing on the on the back end, or you when you construct your data, you know, you can you can do it ahead of time so it's already in there in the triple store, and and so when you do your queries, it's it's all there. Right, and that can depend on what you're doing. So if you have a um, if you have an ontology where you want to expand out, for instance, the uh, you can actually build out some of your um, OWL rules such that uh, if you have, when you actually do inferencing over the data, uh, you've already pre-cooked a lot of the OWL stuff so that it's, it's actually expanded out. But you know, for the actual data you just want to do RDFS, you can actually do a uh, uh, you can actually extract all the inferences for an ontology. And then load those inferences in as well with the. Uh, and then it's when somebody actually asks about one of those things, then it doesn't have to crank in order to. Exactly, get it. it doesn't do nearly as much work, and the stuff that you wouldn't normally get from uh, the you know RDFS only inference engine, uh, you would get as just bare facts because it's already been pre mm -hmm. um, It won't do some of this fancy stuff like property chains. Things that work on the instances themselves, but uh, that's not always the problem. Sometimes you have a knowledge base that is a number of instances, but it's a core thing that you're just uh, applying to a lot of other, uh, you know, a lot of changing data. Mm -hmm. So if you have a lot of data, a lot of changing data, you're using a thing like uh, Virtuoso, you want to make sure that you have, or ideally, you want to have a core of data that. Um, you can pre-cook, you can pre-inference, uh, and will still provide value to the, uh, the parts that you haven't inferenced over yet. So we're also, I think there's some use of, we only have five of those. Yeah, failing in 10 minutes later. Yeah, so we, we've got some instances of ARC. We've got some. ARC. Yeah, um, we've also got what, we've got, um, this, some 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 use of Jenna. You yeah. know, Jenna is very useful on an experimental basis. I mean, how do you spell uh, ARC? A -R, A R C. A R C. We, mm -hmm. And we also are using Jenna um, in. Well, Tim is using Jenna uh, as part of the, the pollution the, stuff. Of Jenna, or the air quality, or the water quality. Water quality, quality stuff is in. Is what is T W? You said is it use ARC or is that Jenna? I thought T W. T W site. The, the site itself, I don't know. Yeah. It's one of those because those are the only two I know of that support updates. And it's one of the <laughs> Possibly Jenna, yeah. but Jenna or Arc. Yeah, it's either one of those. So things. that whole Drupal thing is in a triple store. Yeah, a lot of the data in that, in that Drupal is coming from triple stores, wow. and a lot of those, yeah. the things you're updating to it are actually updating triple yeah. stores as well. That's right. Yeah. So when you're looking at the TW site, um, a, a lot of those pages are being painted based on. Queries. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's it's, 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 it really, it's, you know, TW is a, is a, you know, it, its purpose is to be a, um, a, a semantic application, mm -hmm. a semantic web application, yeah. with more to come. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's see, that, that's probably ARC. Might be ARC. I don't know. I have to check. Yeah. I could have sworn it was Jenna, but yeah, there's, yeah. But there's other interesting things. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know what the, you know, their use of uh, ontologies is in that. Well, they have an ontology that describes like everything on the site. So yeah. all people, professors, schools, presentations, yeah. papers. Considering that Evans involved is probably yeah. <laughs> he loves he loves his ontologies. Yeah. There's a whole thing. I don't know how much reasoning they do per se. I think they use it mostly as just kind of like an organizational model of like all these stuff. Yeah. Kind of yeah I want to do a pitch because actually, uh, next you know next week is actually going to be after Thanksgiving. The next. TWED talk is going to be done by Evan. It's going to be about uh, it's going to be about reasoning. Oh, good. So yeah, reasoning and distributed reasoning. Yeah, <coughs> that's his baby. So that will be um, more on the you know, how do you actually make this stuff happen. Yeah. So we should probably I should probably just end this. Yeah. yeah. Unless there's any other questions. Yeah. <laughs>
I have, to, I have to do it officially. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So thank you all for <laughs> for, for joining us. Um, uh, and as Jim said, this well, first of all, this, this talk is going to be available through the TWED page, tw.rpi.edu slash web slash TWED. Uh, it's going to be in the graph there. It's also going to be in other places on the site. Um, our next TWED talk is going to be after Thanksgiving. This could be our... After Thanksgiving. Then that is, that's what you said, right? Yeah. No. Check the site. We have, <laughs> it's the, it's the uh, official representation. Um, and upcoming, hopefully before the end of the term, uh, we are talking about doing a special um, lightning talks from the grad students, the third and fourth year grad students. Five minute talks talking about their work. They don't know about this yet. If, if they were all here, they would now know about it. So let's uh, let's give Jim a nice. Uh, we'll get Josh to do echo on this. <laughs>